If it's all about the post-pandemic recovery and if deficits no longer matter these days, then what about Africa? France welcoming leaders for a summit devoted to finance and relieving the debt owed by a continent that felt the full brunt of a world economy under lockdown. The age-old question more acute than ever, how to be like the U.S. and Europe and earmark huge sums for healthcare, schools, green energy, infrastructure, instead of using the money to pay interest on old debts. In the case of Sudan, Monday's pledge by Paris to draw down old arrears could help offer a lifeline to a nation trying to transition to democracy after a painful and bloody revolution ended decades of military dictatorship. Will ordinary citizens there feel the relief? More broadly, it's been two decades since the Millennium Goals erased a sea of uh, red ink. Why are so many nations back in a debt trap where they owe huge amounts to both public and private creditors? Is it bad governance, unsustainable needs, and are higher borrowing rates justified for a continent with huge resources and huge potential? Today in the France 24 debate, we're asking, is a new deal for Africa uh, possible? Joining us uh, from uh, Accra, Ghana's finance minister, Ken Aforiata, thank you for being with us. All right, Ken Aforiata setting up there. Uh, with us as well, Benin's former Prime Minister, Lionel Zanzou, a banker in a previous life. How are you, sir? Good evening. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Mara Ferry, Assistant Professor at Gustave Eiffel University. It's east of Paris, author of the forthcoming paper, Does Debt Relief Irresistibly Attract Banks as Honey Attracts Bees? Good evening. Better bees than bears. Right? <laughs> yeah, definitely. Okay. Uh, from uh, Roscoff, that's in Brittany, France, uh, Louis Bedouchat, Senior Advisor at Consultants PWC. Welcome to the show. The France 24 debate on uh, Facebook and on Twitter, hashtag F24 debate. Uh, fewer lives lost in Africa, more livelihoods impacted. Uh, that was the prophecy from Kenneth Foriata a year ago when uh, he uh, joined us here on the show. Solange Mougin has more on how that has in fact played out. A COVID-induced blow to their economies. In 2020, the economic output of African nations was its worst on record. GDP on average decreased by 1.9 percent, a drop that's plunged the continent into a recession for the first time in nearly three decades. Among the most affected nations that depend on tourism, like the Seychelles and Tunisia, another sector that's been hit hard, the fuel industry. With global aviation having dropped to a trickle, the price of petrol dipped greatly, affecting export countries like Angola and Nigeria. Nations that rely heavily on exporting raw materials have also struggled, from cotton exports in Benin to the foraging of minerals in South Africa. Its GDP decreased by 7 percent in 2020. Lockdowns have also taken their toll. Many workers employed on a day-to-day -day basis were suddenly out of work. For many of them, there were no unemployment checks or government help. Job losses and a plethora of other factors have sent poverty jumping across the continent. Increasing by 8 percent, there are now 520 million people in Africa, or some 40 percent of the population, that now live below the extreme poverty line. One of the major challenges many African nations face is colossal debt. Last April, G20 countries, including China, which is Africa's number one creditor, hit the pause button on payments. But now, looking to the future, African nations are seeking ways to lower that debt, to increase foreign investment, and to jumpstart their economies again. Kenneth Oriata, uh, how much has Ghana been hit by the pandemic? What are its needs as you look at this financing conference in Paris? Um, thank you very much indeed. Francois, it's really a pleasure to be back after, after last year. Um, I mean, Africa, as you know, is uh, literally, I guess, on the brink of a, of a, of a lost decade, um, a period in which economies and governance you know have been very good um, and to come to a point where a growth rate for the continent is um, somewhere at negative 2.8 for Ghana we were expecting 
a growth of 4.8, and we ended up um, actually quite lucky compared to the rest of the region at a plus 0.4%. Uh, but that clearly also led to uh, a deficit of 11.7% as opposed to under 5% and put the economy under much stress and pushing our debt to GDP ratio uh, north of 76.4%. Um, um, so when, when you look at the continent, um, where the fiscal deficit for Africa has risen from 4.7% to 8.7% last year, and overall debt levels uh, just literally ballooned from 57% of GDP um, to 70% in 2021, um, you see a rather precarious situation of a liquidity and without the proper intervention, a solvency issue, uh, which will really create a problem um, for for our continent of 1.3 billion uh, people. Does, does um, Ghana so have a solvency an issue then? Um, well, we are currently at 76% um, um, debt to GDP in which I mean, for us we put in an intervention program of a Ghana CARES program, which is about a quarter of our GDP um, to bridge that period between now and 2023. Um, so we are tackling it um, head on. Um, and I think, Francois, one of the big issues that we've been telling the World Bank is that a, a full-scale digitalization program is important for the continent. The continent has about 430 billion um, of tax revenue at about 12, 13% of revenue to GDP for the continent. Of digitalization, we should be able to get to 20 or double that, uh, which means you literally will have about $1 trillion um, dollars of revenue. Added to that is the age old problem of illicit financial flows, which has to be tackled from the West. Um, because most of it is commercial, uh, which involves multinationals. But be that as it may, we are confronted with a liquidity problem, which could tumble into solvency, and we have a health crisis, which has a financial gap of about $425 billion, which needs to be filled, and then resources for the stimulus uh, that we have seen uh, in the West to make sure that we get more productive and drawing the private sector. So you mentioned at the outset we're on the brink of a lost decade. So what does this summit do to stop that? I, I think there are two things. I mean, they, they, they have advocated um, two pillars. One, dealing with the changing uh, multilateral um, sentiment with the U.S.'s support of the $650 billion, um, SDR um, allocation, which will be helpful. There's another 260 and billion of unused SDRs um, with the Western country, which can also uh, be used. Um, now, of the 650 billion, of course, tragically, it's only um, 33 billion of it, about 5%, that will come to Africa. And we are advocating that that should move to about 25 to 30% of that for us to really tackle the problem we have. Compound added to that would be um, the unused SDRs, which countries have discretion to use, so that we are able to give a lot more money um, to the IMF and also uh, find ways to support um, health, education, and infrastructure, uh, which remain the Achilles heel in this instance. And the United Nations, do you agree with um, the prognosis there? Are we really on the brink of a lost decade? It's different from country to country. Yeah, no? No, no, I fully agree with everything uh, uh, the minister has developed. A very comprehensive view uh, of the situation. I would just underline that it is a social crisis and not purely um, an economic uh, crisis. So, yes, we, we, we have lost uh, on, on our gains uh, against... Uh, Poverty, extreme poverty. We, we, we have lost a, a lot of ground during uh, these pandemics. Because, yes, Ghana, and congratulations, is in a positive territory in 2020 in terms of growth. Right. But 
In Ghana, like in my neighboring country of Benin, we have uh, demographic growth, which is sort of 3%. Right. Accordingly, uh, what we have had... So growth has to be above population growth. Absolutely. Yeah. So what we have is per capita a significant uh, loss during these pandemics. When you consider the West, and we have not the same toolkit, when you consider the West, the net uh, revenue income of uh, the households in the USA have grown in 2020 by 6%, which is a huge uh, jump. Uh, and in, in a country like France, and that's because it has been protected and it is positive. A 0.5% right. increase uh, when you have a recession of 8%. We had not, we have, we have, we have not the, this freedom to develop safety nests. So it is a social crisis. Is part of it down to currency, the fact that, you know, if you're the United States, you can send out those stimulus checks to everybody. If mm -hmm. you're Europe, uh, you can issue bonds and uh, yeah, people we, will buy them. And yeah. so you can, you can pay later. Now, I think it's very important for this summit to develop the proper toolkit. We have no guarantee for access to uh, of our corporates, small, medium companies, even the large companies, access to credit. We are maybe perceived as over-indebted, but I'm speaking in front of a specialist. We are dramatically under-indebted as far as uh, the households and the SMEs, the corporates in general in Africa have access to credit. We are not financed properly. So in this summit, I think it's not purely the public debt issue. And it's important that we, we receive some transfers through uh, SDR and various technical means. The question is, how do we finance all the parties, not only the states, but the households and the corporates? Orthodoxy has been turned on its head this past year uh, when we see that suddenly these deficits have ballooned and we're also told that the deficits don't matter as much as they used to, Marin Ferry. So what can we do to get the credits to those small businesses in Africa and not just to, 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 to national states? Yeah, um, I fully agree with all what have been said so far. Um, what I would say, not especially regarding the SMEs and the households, since I'm working definitely on the public debt, if I may, um, I think that, as you mentioned at the beginning of, uh, of your, your speech, uh, one of the problems is that, indeed, um, the borrowing costs for African states are really expensive, especially when it comes about the debt that is owed to private creditors. And this is also the difference between the states like African states and states like European uh, countries or North Africa countries. The thing is that African countries have huge financing needs, both at the state level, but also, as uh, Professor Zinzu uh, mentioned it, also at lower uh, levels, such as the SMEs and the households. The thing is, how can we attract capital and how the state can also um, contract some loads to uh, finance its uh, economic do you, activities? Do you have the sense, Marin, that, uh, that people are willing to try stuff? You know, that, yeah. that perhaps now we're, we're, we can experiment, we can do things that we hadn't tried before. Yeah, definitely. Uh, the, the, the thing is that uh, if we want that uh, people, for instance, household and or SMEs uh, invest massively in the domestic activity, um, there is also a need for um, uh, a proper economic and macroeconomic outlook at the country level. So it, ne it means that the states also must be um, pretty in good shape in terms of public finance uh, as well as in terms of debt. So this uncertain environment at the state level might, might so to somehow uh, create disincentives for uh, private sectors. Louis Bedoucha, I mentioned at the outset the Millennium Goals. Uh, we, we all remember uh, uh, the pop singer Bono uh, uh, riling up uh, world leaders two decades ago. They excused a huge amount of, uh, of public debt. Uh, what's happened? What happened? Why, 
they they didn't wipe the slate clean. What? Why? Why are? Why is the debt back with a vengeance? Okay. Uh, thank you, uh, François. Uh, just one thing, which is I, I would just uh, go back to our books of economy. You know, you, you have to remind that uh, simply you have always uh, an equation to satisfy in economy that uh, uh, saving is equal to, to investment. This is a, a very basic equation, but uh, it is very crucial to understand this in Africa, you know. Africa is like an high-speed train, you know. Uh, Africa is uh, growing very fast in terms of population. Uh, I'll just remind you that Nigerian uh, inhabitants will be in, 200, in 2050, 400 million inhabitants. So all these people in Africa need uh, goods, need investment, and the, the train is launched, you know, and it needs investment, a lot of investment. Unfortunately, savings uh, of Africa is not co con congruent with this uh, level of investment. So Africa needs to find, to fetch its food. Its food is uh, savings outside. It's very simple, you know. It's uh, The equation is, is very simple. That's not, that, that's not exactly go, what Lionel Zanzou said, which he said that if only Af uh, Africans had more access to borrowing, then you would, uh, then you'd be able to uh, uh, fund all those projects that you're talking about for the, yes, uh, for the Africa uh, tomorrow. Yes, Lionel obviously is right. The only problem is that domestic savings is not sufficient to to feed the machine. You know, you need to go outside to finance your economy. Ghana, Cote d'Ivoire. Many countries, you know, they go outside and they, they raise, they issue euro bond and they issue what they want, you know, on the commercial market, you know, not simply on the concessional debt. In that respect, you know, it becomes very complicated to finance high speed economy like uh, Cote d'Ivoire is growing at 8 percent, you know, per year. And they are doing this since 2011, you know. 2011, 2021, the average rate of growth of Cote d'Ivoire was 6.6%, which is a, in history of all the world, you, you don't have so many uh, countries uh, doing this. It was the case of Russia, it was the case of China, Malaysia, but not so many countries. Ghana is very close to that, you know. So they need money, desperately need money. What happens these days is that simply there is an, a huge exogenous shock on all the economies of Africa, first thing. Second thing, if I may, I would recommend not to mix all the subjects, you know. We, we are not going to solve the issue of the banking system, the issue of the inclusion, the banking inclusion, the issue of the households. We are in front of a massive state problem, which is one, vaccination of the population. I remind that only 2% African are vaccinated today, except Morocco, the situation is very critical. And second, the IMF evaluate, and I, I, I thank uh, the minister uh, Atta to have said that, $600 billion uh, to put on the table to compensate the situation of the, of the pandemic. This is the situation. We should not maybe lose too much time or too long on different subjects that were always on the table, already on the table. There is a shock and we need to compensate it. And I agree with everything which has been said. For one, I must recognize that for one time, the IMF was very quick. I simply uh, expect IMF to be very, very quick and not to wait one year or half a year to, to for example, to release this uh, 630 billion DTS. Yeah, uh, the, the head of the IMF, uh, uh, who spoke uh, to France 24, she says, uh, she's a fan of this new uh, uh, system for renegotiating debts, which involve both public and private le lenders. Uh, Kristalina Georgieva telling France 24 Stephen Carroll uh, that it's uh, better than a blanket write-off, uh, which is what you had two decades ago. Universal cancellation actually has some opponents in South Africa that are saying, look, we have done the right thing. We haven't taken a lot of debt. Why is it that you are encouraging uh, to reward countries that may have stepped out of their uh, debt sustainability uh, space? I, 
absolutely believe that we need everything. This is the kind of situation you need all hands on deck. Uh, do you agree with um, uh, Christina Georgieva, uh, Kenna Foriata? Do you agree that uh, um, a blanket universal cancellation of debt is not the solution? Um, uh, thank you very much, Francois. I think that we, we really should be careful uh, about language which then uh, clouds our common humanity. Um, so to, to have a throwback into the hippic era in which there was mass um, sort of debt forgiveness and cancellation as a backdrop, um, you know, re reflects an irresponsible uh, continent. We all know as we sit today that this is the, the sort of the, uh, one of the um, uh, most impactful, um, I guess, regression that we have had um, since the Great Depression or since Bretton Woods, um, where it is clear where the problem is, is coming from, um, where continents um, debt to GDP, you know, it's gone up by 20%. Um, and so the question becomes for a continent that by 2050 will be a quarter of the world's population and maybe 60% of the youth. Um, how do you not tackle this problem in a way in which you are seeing the humanity of our people, you know, as, 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 as a universe? And I think that's what we are dealing with. So the question of avoiding um, insolvency uh, becomes um, prominent. And um, when you look at your ability to have about 13 or north of 13 trillion, um, suddenly within a period of uh, 15 months for the West, uh, it's not a shortage of capital. It's a shortage of, of, of the system that we have, where you have about $100 trillion of assets under management and uh, Africa barely able to use 2% of its GDP compared to 20% by the West. Um, you see a global architecture that truly is not fit for purpose. And so the idea this time is whether we can sit down to be bold about the future, to avert this, and to make sure that Africa stands strong. And it's going to take a myriad of ways to solve that whether it is um, debt forgiveness, whether it is debt restructuring, whatever it is, if you look at the DSSI, the intention was to give people a chance um, so that the issue of liquidity will be solved. So short-term liquidity issues is an intervention, but then the long-term issues of restructuring, making sure that our systems are strong enough um, to yield the type of um, um, revenue that we have to through digitalization and to be able to create um, a productive continent of manufacturing um, that would ensure that global supply chains are not compromised. And so let me ask you, as, as the Minister, as the minister of Finance for, for, for Ghana, a country uh, where the size of the uh, official deficit last year doubled, um, is it about putting out the fire right now? and? Uh, uh, trying to st stop it from being completely unsustainable? Or is it, like you say, uh, about dealing with uh, the rules when it comes to how you handle private creditors? Wh wh where do you start? Um, first of all, it didn't double. I mean, it didn't move from 62 to 76 percent. And so we should be careful about the hyperboles there. Um, what, where do we start? Um, what we did uh, for ourselves as our president said, is that we cannot bring lives back, but we can manage the economy competently. So we, we, we made sure we had programs that will keep the economy going and people having incomes uh, in their homes to be able to um, have some decency of life. Um, and then we also put together um, uh, a program called Ghana Cares, which is equivalent to a quarter of our GDP to push towards growth and recovery um, that we are doing. So it has to be multifaceted and it has to recognize that there's life today and to be kept, you still have to build your infrastructure, health systems, education, et cetera, 
and the private sector for productivity. Now, the issue of having market access, as you know, is a very complicated issue. Yes, Cote d'Ivoire and Ghana can go to the markets, which we did this year, and we had good support for $3 billion. But at what cost? About 8% handle, you know, on average, uh, from the, for the 7 to the 30-year bonds um, that, that we got. Um, and you compare that to maybe a Belarus or Greece, uh, in which the ratings are not different, and we are paying, you know, 500 to 600 basis points more. And that's an incredible amount of money for no reason than an African address. You know, so those are a part of the series of corrections that the current financial architecture uh, needs to be um, to be looked at um, to really um, just change it for the better. But let you me know, bring I in suspect... Leonid Zanzu on this. Uh, do you agree that um, Africa is treated unfairly by um, credit rating agencies? I think that unfairly is a proper word. I think that the rating agencies have a role to play. If you take Ghana, Ghana has made history in terms of the duration of debt. So we have now access to long-term financing, and it was essential. When I arrived as Prime Minister of Benin, everything which was exigible from uh, uh, the, the debt market for the country was at a duration of one year. Okay, then Benin, two months ago, has issued a debt for 30 years. But the cost remains absolutely a cost reflecting an overestimation, over a risk uh, uh, sort of, uh, of <clears throat> essential vision of the market. We are overestimated in terms of risk. And many people are adverse to the African risk. So what do you many. think about it? I mean, I speak in front of a specialist of managing the public debt, but we have to make clear that we are under indebted if you consider the whole of the economy and not only the states. And we have to make very clear in the narrative on, on Africa, there is no default. Ghana will not default. Benin will not default. Zambia has defaulted. Yes, but when you add up Zambia, Zimbabwe, Eritrea, Eritrea a, a certain number of fragile countries, it is less than 8% of the GDP of Africa. You cannot use, you, you, you will not use Cyprus or Greece to say it's absolutely absurd uh, to have negative interest rates in France or Germany. So let's be clear, there, there, there are ways to cure the, the risk of default on a handful of countries. You can go on the secondary market and buy them back. All that, I hope, are, as we speak, uh, dealt with in the summit. You, you need some technicalities, but more importantly, the narrative on the default risk of Africa is, as the minister said, only related to our Ghanaian or Beninese address. It's not the truth in our fundamentals. It's and in not terms, the truth, but no. those premiums are higher. And if a country like Ethiopia then defaults, then they'll become to higher say, for everyone, including Benin and Ghana, right? To say the truth, we go down. If you take uh, uh, the, the most recent issuing, uh, you had interest rates a bit below, it was end of 2019, but you had interest rates a bit below the GDP growth rate, which starts to be virtuous. It's important that we do not pay more than the growth of our GDP in terms of interest on our debt. Then, if you are respecting that, you have a chance to have a virtuous circle. And, and, and the governance is very important. A country like Ghana has impressed the world in terms of progress in reforms and governance. And the African Union is now negotiating on the debt, the cost of debt, the duration of debt, the forgiveness of part of the debt, the creation of a secondary market, guarantees funds, and so on, collectively. What is interesting in the room today, in the summit, is that you have the president of the African Union, you have the special envoys, and the ministers have, coming from everywhere in Africa, a collective, the beginning of a collective management of the debt issue of the continent. This had never happened. So I think we could have some management uh, progress. 
And last word, the, the diaspora is also important for this imbalance which has been evoked in between uh, domestic savings Why? Because and they investment. They send remittances home, yes. or is it because they have lobbying power in Washington, in Paris? I hope they develop lobbying power. <laughs> and, and when you take some of the special envoys of the African unions, some have been head of Credit Suisse or have, have, have had international positions of influence. But more importantly, in 2020, we had an increase in remittances when in 2009, you had a major decrease. So you had solidarity from the diaspora to Africa. It's an important inflow of added savings. It's also important. You have not only the market and the, and the direct investment flows. You have also uh, the, our residents outside who are more and more important. Uh, Marin Ferry, those remittances, uh, economists say they're the, the sort of the most effective way to help development, some say, is that, is that an overstatement? Those remittances, just to remind our viewers, which is people uh, who, who live abroad can sending home money to their family. Yeah, yeah definitely. Uh, it is one of the most important financing sources, external financing sources for developing countries and low-income countries all over the world, and of course, African countries uh, in this specific topic. But uh, this is not, I mean, uh, I think we should not oppose remittances to other type of external financing, such as uh, ODA, official development assistance, such as also borrowing to the external private sector, or for instance, to also some other sources such as FDI. I mean, if um, the country needs some money to uh, finance, for instance, infrastructures, remittances won't do that job, right? Mm. So we still need, I mean, the African countries and the low-income countries still need to have a wide access to various external financing sources in order to be able to invest in massive infrastructures, in order to invest in education programs, in health programs, in order to tackle a lot of issues that needs a huge amount of financing. So let's talk about that, because Leonid Zanzou mentioning African nations coming together at forums like this summit that's taking place in Paris. And just to give our viewers an idea, uh, right now we talked about Zambia. It's uh, defaulted. It's the only country in Africa that's defaulted since the pandemic. But there are others in distress, some of them big players like Ethiopia, Cameroon, Kenya. Ghana is well mentioned on the list uh, by the International Monetary Fund. Uh, before the crisis, the common obsession was how big debt was in comparison to uh, what a country uh, produces each year. In other words, what its uh, GDP debt to GDP ratio is. And there you see the numbers there that you saw a minute ago there were, were included countries that are doing fine, excuse me for saying it, like, like Japan or Italy, which, which are sound economically. So we're now starting to wonder if that debt to GDP ratio shouldn't be replaced by something else. For instance, and we see it here, debt services as a multiple of government health expenditure, just to give an example. In other words, this is how much Mozambique, which is number one on the list in Africa, pays in interest on debt it owes compared to how much it spends on health care. And it brings us back, Marin Ferry, to... Uh, to what Louis Bédouchat said at the outset. At the end of the day, this has to be about getting uh, vaccines in citizens' arms. It has to be about uh, shoring up the infrastructure and, and, uh, and, 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 and helping the educational system. You can't do it if you're just paying off debt, right? No, definitely. Yes, this is a vir not even debt. Sorry, excuse me. Interest, interest on, on debt. debt. Yes, this is a vicious circle. This is what we call the real burden effect, meaning that uh, all these interests and the share of the capital that all the countries have to reimburse are uh, crowding out the financing of necessary public expenditures. And if I may to go back to what Lionel Zanzou has said and the other uh, interveners have said, uh, there is indeed this issue of why this debt is so expensive. Why are the risk premiums so high on those markets? And from my point of view, which is uh, the academic one and 
I'm looking at all this research paper. I can cite one paper, uh, I think published two years ago, that shows basically that if we take all the characteristics of the developing countries, okay, and we compare uh, developing countries to an African countries with, which are sharing the same similarities in terms of economic structure, uh, public finance, uh, institutional quality, the African countries is going to face a higher risk premium on the market, every, holding everything else constant. Why? Because of a, maybe a stigma on these uh, bond markets, uh, maybe because also of the history of the uh, crisis in Africa, which has been um, has been uh, pretty important over uh, the in the early 80s and in the uh, late 90s. So maybe there is this bad reputation that has nothing to do with what we observe currently in terms of uh, GDP growth, in terms of uh, institutional quality, because we have some countries which are pretty strong in terms of institutional quality and fiscal capacity that are still facing really high risk premium on international financial markets, which is not justify by the economic fundamentals of this country. This is what uh, Barry Eschengen in the 80s called the original sin. And we can extend his concept to the double original sin, meaning that there is a risk premium which is not justified by the economic fundamentals of those countries. How do you get rid of that risk premium, Louis Bedusha? Oh, uh, first of all, I think, w I'm sorry to say, we should not be naive uh, there are sometimes coup d'état in Africa. You know, it's not uh, it's not a, a road uh, full of, uh, of roses. You know, uh, so when you go to a, a standard bank and you say, "Would you like to make a loan to Burundi, to uh, uh, to to Ethiopia, or uh, uh, to Mauritania?" He, he looks at history of uh, of the of the country. You know, and when you see that there is a transition in a country without election, when you see that there is a civil war somewhere, uh, you, you, you need to, to protect your, your, your investor. So I think uh, it's very nice to, to say uh, Africa is very, has a very bad reputation, you know, but uh, uh, bankers are, are not enfants de cœur, you know, they, they, they just They're look at They're not choir the, boys. Yes, exactly. They look at the history, the statistics, and they, they make you well, now I come back to the to the your, your precise question how do you improve the, the the risk premium you know first you you have good projects you have good governance you have good history you have good organization and uh, it, normally Mr. Oforiata knows that very well for Ghana he could uh, say that we could say same thing for Cote d'Ivoire for Morocco for uh, Rwanda now for Botswana for uh, many countries in Africa. It's not, you know, we cannot say Africa, you know, it's 54 countries with differences between uh, country A, country B, you know, and so we need to look uh, carefully about the, the efforts. This is the reason why uh, Mr. Georgieva and some countries are against a global uh, uh, cancellation of the debt, which would uh, constitute a moral hazard and a uh, uh, a kind of premium for for the bad guys. Should we reward the bad guys? I'm sorry to say that. You know, should we reward the bad guys? Maybe it's better to reward the good guys and and to improve the the risk premium for the good the good pupils, which is the case for for Ghana, which is the case for Cote d'Ivoire, which is the case for Morocco, which is the case probably for Botswana uh, and some other countries. This is a story, you know. Uh, let me bring in Ken Oforiat on this before we go, because we're running short on time. Um, you heard uh, earlier, uh, you heard earlier Louis Bedusha mentioning how right now the priority is vaccines. Right now the priority is getting over uh, the pandemic. Um, f fresh capital. Where would you, where is the place where Ghana needs it most at this particular moment? Kenneth Oriata, can you hear me? Can you can you hear me? Ah, now I can hear you loud yes. and clear. Can Apologies. you hear me now? Now I can hear you. Yeah. Where does Ghana great, need capital great. most? Where does it need fresh capital the most? Okay. Thank you very much, Francois. I think it's really hard to keep my seatbelt on in listening to 
um, what my colleague just talked about, you know, sort of the, the, the normal rhetoric of um, why Africa must have a risk premium or why certain countries too. Because, I mean, there was a point in time where uh, Russia or Belarus or Greece, you know, had such terrible numbers. Uh, however, there was a reason to rationalize why these places were investable places and where, therefore, when I go to the market, they somehow command a much lower premium than I do. And that is inexplainable. Um, so we are in a situation where we cannot breathe. And there's an institutional solution, um, such as an Africa stability mechanism, which then enables the address, you know, to be, to be cured or to be inoculated um, by these um, sort of differences in countrywide perceptions. And those are the type of changes that will require in the global financial landscape. Because truly, as one of the colleagues said, our assets and capacity to produce our capital needs that will be required. And for Ghana, uh, we have clearly ascertained, and I think it's for most African countries, to be able to bridge this 450 odd billion um, dollars that will be required for um, to support um, sort of the COVID recovery and make sure our health systems, you know, are strong. Uh, Ghana has that same issue of being able to pay for these vaccines. And because, Francois, I mean, if you look at 1.4 billion doses being given around the world and Africa having done 20 odd million, um, you begin to see um, this um, accursed um, vaccine nationalism that we are experiencing. So one, to pay um, for the vaccines to make sure our people are strong and healthy and to move into the recovery stage. And we anticipate that we will need about 30 billion of our own money and another 70 billion of um, joint ventures uh, and PPP type transactions for us to be able to move on. And in that way, we will then also be able to manage this um, uh, increased um, debt to GDP ratio to afford um, sustainability. Um, so even for, for, this conference. Um, yeah, I was going to yeah. say because we're out of time. Just leaving very, this conference. Ju just I want to ask Lionel Zanzu because we're leaving out of this conference. I think, I think really we need France needs to be bold and strong. Whether it's a Marshall or Merkel or Macron plan, um, whatever it is, it has to be. Uh, but it will be very foolish, as um, Winston Churchill said, um, to, uh, to, to, to not acknowledge the gravity of the hour that we are in. And um, I think our thoughts um, should be not only to win this battle of SDR liquidity, but really to fight the war, uh, which is um, to change the structure of the global financial architecture. All right, which you said, Lionel Zanzu, perhaps we're seeing the 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 the, the beginning of it. The the uh, with with this uh, with this summit. Yeah, I think like, exactly like the minister. I, mean, I think we have the possibility to finance the vaccination, but we have to put in place more safety nests for the population. It is a social crisis before uh, be being an economic uh, crisis, and it's important also to equip our private sector with sort of long-term capital, sort of equity. We have not the sovereign funds. We have not the various ways of developed countries or even emerging countries in order to equip our, 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 our firms with solvency instruments right. and guarantees. And I think it's important to put part of the money which will flow in in that sort of social and productive sort of use of funds. All right, let's see. We'll, we'll see what comes out of, uh, of this conference. A crisis can be an opportunity. No, 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 you have too many deaths and victims in and this so on in your, in your family, in mine, to say something like that. We didn't need absolutely pandemics. Should I say differently? For from awareness this, of our From problems. this crisis, an opportunity. We have better to read the academic work. All right. We don't need a pandemic for that. But Lionel Zanzou. There will be a step change. All right. Lionel Zanzou, I want to thank you. I want to thank you as well, Marin Ferry. Uh, Ken Oforiata for being with us uh, from Accra. Liwi Bedusha uh, in Roscoff in Brittany, France. Thank you for joining us here in the France 24 debate.